In this video, I'm going to be talking about the sleep issues in postmenopausal women. So I'm Dr. Manveer Bhatia, a senior neurologist and a sleep specialist with more than 30 years of experience. I will just share the screen to start going through the presentation. So the outline of this talk is going to be what are the common sleep issues in women, how to diagnose them and how to treat them. But this is going to be a case based discussion. So we will not get into too much of the whys and the hows, but go forward on detection, evaluation and treatment. So firstly, let's start by talking about how big is this problem? Is this something to be really considered or should we worry about this a lot? It's been seen by most studies that the premenopausal sleep complaints are in the range of 16 to 40%. The perimenopausal become almost 40 to 47% and postmenopausal can touch almost to the tune of 60%. Thus, showing that there is a significant problem or postmenopausal women face a lot of sleep issues. So, thus, these do need to be evaluated and treated accordingly. <clears throat> so, what are the common sleep disorders or the primary sleep disorders? The first, of course, is the insomnia, which is the most frequent. It is already known to have a higher prevalence in women, but as the age advances, it can become even bigger problem and considerable increase. The sleep apnea, it's known, it's more commoner in men, but postmenopausal women, the risk becomes same and it also becomes almost 2.5 times higher than in the premenopausal. And the restless leg syndromes and the periodic limb movement disorder also tends to increase with the age. <clears throat> so just to go over briefly that what are the factors that can impact sleep? This could be mood issues such as depression, anxiety, bipolar disorders. <clears throat> I'm sorry. It could also be some caregiver responsibilities which people enter into at this stage. A career change, that means one can have retirement, post-retirement issues, then this can cause a significant impact. Then we have a few primary sleep disorders as mentioned, that is insomnia, restless leg syndrome, and sleep apnea. Then, of course, the well-known hormonal influences, which can cause the vasomotor symptoms and which can be a big deterrent to a good quality or a good continuity of sleep. And then there are the circadian influences on aging, the changes with the melatonin, uh, production, the timing, etc., which can cause impairment in the continuity of sleep. So thus, all these factors have to be considered when one sees a patient who presents with a sleep issue, try and find out or determine that what is the primary cause or causes which could be contributing to that individual's poor sleep. So these are common sleep disorders that are uh, already been mentioned and we will go over them in a little bit more detail. So let's take them one by one. First being insomnia. So what is insomnia? Insomnia is a term which is used quite often loosely, but we have a separate or a distinct set of criteria which should be fulfilled when one calls them or labels these patients as insomnia. So the sleep issues could be difficulty in falling asleep, difficulty in staying asleep, waking up too early, overall a poor sleep quality, and having next day consequences, despite having an opportunity and adequate time to sleep. If less than three months, they're called as short-term insomnia, and if more than three months, is called as a chronic insomnia. <clears throat> so for, to fulfill the criteria of insomnia, we have to have 
the night symptoms as well as the neck, the day. So day symptoms could be some things like mood changes, irritability, concentration problems, body aches, headaches, etc. And these could all be the day symptoms. What is the impact of poor sleep? <clears throat> the impact of poor sleep can start right from the brain and go on to every possible system. So we mentioned this could have things like impairment in cognitive impairments, irritability, memory changes. It can affect the immune system, making you more vulnerable to infections. It can have an impact on the metabolic, causing metabolic syndromes, pre-diabetes and obesity. It can affect the cardiovascular system, resulting in changes in blood pressure, cardiac rhythm, arrhythmias and increased risk of getting an atherosclerotic heart disease, increased risk of diabetes, increased risk of hypertension. So thus, sleep serves as a baseline kind of an indicator, parameter for good health, and if disrupted, can impact health. So what are the common, when a person presents with poor sleep, what should one keep in mind? This could be vasomotor symptoms, could be like I said mood disorders, it could be a primary sleep disorder, fibromyalgia, any painful condition, a physical medical condition, some medications, genitourinary complaints in this age group and overall just a poor sleep hygiene. So this is again to emphasize that insomnia is a symptom, it's not the final diagnosis, it's just a complaint, we do need to get more information. <clears throat> So I'll go briefly into two kind of models of insomnia because when we approach a patient, we should then try and go deeper into the history. <clears throat> so first is this a 3P model, also called as a Spillman's model. The three Ps are the predisposing factors, the precipitating factors, and the perpetuating factors. And this is the model for development of insomnia <clears throat> and also development of uh, chronic insomnia. That means a transformation from acute to a chronic. So what is a predisposing? Predisposing are some of the conditions of personality traits that one has. The people who are very meticulous, fastidious, uh, obsessive, conscientious, and the warriors, and also some genetic components. So these are the people who have a predisposition. And if you look at this chart, so this is the insomnia threshold, but the predisposing individuals are sitting there, but they don't really have insomnia as yet. Then comes a precipitating event. This event could be a bereavement, could be a change in job, a change in house, any trivial something which upsets you. And that can cross the threshold and lead to the development of something called as an insomnia. However, <clears throat> as time passes, patients with this acute insomnia will gradually come back to their baseline and again come into their predisposing situation or condition. However, if the third P, that is the perpetuating factors, adds on, what are the perpetuating factors? Those are things like perpetual worry about sleep, uh, attempts to kind of catch up on sleep all the time that you are wanting to get into bed and try and catch up on sleep, uh, taking a lot of sleep aids, sleep help. These factors then transform what is called as the acute insomnia into the chronic insomnia. And that's why this marker for three months. So thus, this is the very important model to be kept in mind when one is evaluating a patient with insomnia. <clears throat> the other hypothesis, this is the hyper arousal hypothesis. That means now we know that these individuals who are having insomnia, they have something called as an emotional arousal. This could be some depression, anxiety, just internalization of all the emotions and stressful events, a fear of sleep. So these are all causing something called as a heightened emotional arousal. Or you have something, the physiological changes, something like stimulants which they are taking. These are all causing a CNS arousal and together they cause insomnia. 
over a period of time, you come to something called as the unhelpful thinking that if I don't sleep, I don't know what will happen tomorrow. That causes them to become more awake and they get more frustrated, more anxious. The emotions are changing, continuously tossing, turning. All these factors cause what is worsening of insomnia, perpetuation of insomnia, and that's the vicious cycle of insomnia. So that's how this whole insomnia can start and get worse over a period of time. So what is the next condition? And that is the obstructive sleep apnea. So obstructive sleep apnea, as the word itself tells you, there's an obstruction in the breathing passages during sleep resulting in apnea. Apnea is a pause in breathing of at least 10 seconds. What are the major symptoms of this? Just to say that the symptoms are loud snoring, choking, difficulty in breathing at night with sleepiness and tiredness in the day. And this is what it is, that this is the nose, this is the oral cavity, this is the palate, and this is the oropharynx. Normally the air goes in and we breathe out and this is an open kind of passage. It can start getting a little narrow and when it gets completely obstructed and that's the breathing stops and that's an apneic event. <clears throat> Just to highlight that there are gender differences in obstructive sleep apnea. So men more often will present with snoring, apneas, choking and very severe sleepiness. Women most often present with something called as poor sleep, fragmented sleep, and they'll come with this complaint and body aches, headaches, and depressive features. So thus, 90% of women may remain undiagnosed, undetected with this obstructive sleep apnea, get labeled as depression, and they may present with insomnia, fatigue, and this can become like a vicious cycle for them. So the threshold for detection and evaluation of sleep apnea in women has to be considerably much lower. How does one test this? We have numerous ways of testing. We have, of course, well, the test is called as an overnight sleep study. And the ultimate and the best test is uh, numerous sensors to be placed on the head, eyes, chin, snoring, chest belt, oxygen, etc. But we also have some simpler techniques of testing. And this is maybe just three or two or three sensors, one for the nasal, the breathing, and then there's for the chest belt and the saturation. This can also give you enough information if you are suspecting a person to have sleep apnea. The other one is something as small as this. This is a a device which can record the through the pulse uh, wave, it can record the breathing and the oxygen saturation, usually for over three nights, and the data can be received on the cloud, and this is a disposable device. So for those who are not yet ready to get the full sleep test, but are candidates where you think uh, sleep apnea diagnosis is highly probable, these could be offered. And just to show you that this is like a normal airflow signal with normal belts and oxygen saturation. This is, of course, a complete sleep study which shows these red blocks are like apnea events with desaturation. And the level three devices can also show something like this. What is the relationship between these? So the menopause is a risk for cardiovascular uh, development or the diseases and sleep apnea also adds to this. Thus, this cycle needs to be broken or the health is going to be impaired. 